doggone it. Hi, brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, we're going to do some studying today. It's based off the Bible, but it's a book written by Witness Lee, and it's called The Knowledge of Life. And he uses the Bible to, uh, verses to teach, and, but he adds his, uh, his own interpretation. And I, and I believe it will help us to better understand what it means to be born again and have the spirit of life in us. God's sp spirit that dwells in us beside our, our human spirit. And it helps us and it gives us the power to overcome the body of sin, the flesh. Okay? But this part of the book I'm going to read is called, it's about the three lives that is in it, that are all in us at the same time and the four laws. The laws of the spirit, the laws of the f sin, the law of our own spirit. And there's like, but I'm going to explain these things to you and it's going to help you better understand what it means to be born again and overcome the body of sin. Okay, and these, this is a free book you can order. They don't charge anything, so. Three, it's by Witness Lee. Three lives and four laws is where we're going to start. We now come to see the ninth main point in the knowledge of life that the three lives and four laws, this is a truth of extreme importance in the Bible. If we want to clearly know the condition of our inner spiritual life, or if we desire to lead an overcoming life free from sins, a a thorough understanding of this basic truth is necessary. Okay, part one, three lives. The definition of the three lives. The three lives spoken of here are the three lives that are within every saved person. Man's life, Satan's life, and God's life. Ordinarily, men think there is only one life within man, that is, the human life, which is obtained by, from the parents. But the Bible shows that due to the fall of man besides the human life, there is also in man the life of Satan, which is in the flesh. Therefore, Romans, <clears throat> therefore Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20 says that in man, that is in the flesh of man, there dwells also sin. Sin here refers to the life of Satan. This flesh, which contains the life of Satan, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, continues to remain within man after he is saved, and often lusts against the Spirit. Therefore, after a person is saved, he still has Satan's life in him. So we still have sin, but it's trapped in the flesh because of what Jesus done. Moreover, John chapter 3, verses 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 also says, He that hath the Son hath life. That is the life of God. That This shows that one who believes in the Son of God and is saved has not only his own original human life and the life of Satan obtained through the fall by the flesh, but also we have the eternal life of God, this, the Holy Spirit in us. <clears throat> okay. Part B, the origin, of the, three, the origin of the three lives. The Bible says that when God created Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Thus, Adam obtained the created life of man. Then God put man in the Garden of Eden before two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. According to re the revelations given later, in the Bible, the tree of life signifies God, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil signifies Satan. And Adam represents mankind. Hence, that day in the Garden of Eden, that is, in the universe, a situation developed which involved three parties, man, God, and Satan. Satan is the opponent of God, and the focus of his struggling with God is man. Both Satan and God wanted man. God desired man for the accomplishment of his will, while Satan wanted him for the fulfillment of his e evil desire. The method of both Satan and God in gaining man was through life. God's intention was for, a, for man to eat the fruit of the tree of life and thus obtain his cre uncreated life and be united with him. However, Satan enticed man to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thus causing man to obtain his fallen life and be mixed with him because he defiled Eve he mixed defiled Eve as in I believe he slept with Eve and that's why she bore Cain and Abel Cain was of the seed of Satan mixed with Eve 
and Abel, the good one, was mixed of Adam's seed with Eve. One up and one down. Twins. The twin system. But that's a different, whole other thing to explain. On that day, Adam deceived as he was by Satan. Adam was deceived as he was by Satan. Ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Henceforth, Satan's life entered into man, causing him to become corrupted. Thus, besides his own original created life, man also obtained the fallen life of Satan. In the New Testament time, God put his life in, the son, in his Son to be manifested among men, so that by believing in his Son and receiving him, man may obtain his life. Thus, besides our original created human life and the life of Satan obtained through the fall, we also obtain the life of God. Therefore, the three lives within us who are saved are obtained through creation, the fall and salvation, respectively. Coming forth from the creating hands of God, we obtained the created human life passing through Adam. We became fallen and obtained the fallen life of Satan getting into Christ. We are saved and obtained the uncreated life of God. Because God wasn't created, he is omnipotent. He just is and was. Okay, part C. The location of the three lives. <clears throat> According to scriptural revelations, the three different lives of man, Satan, and God entered respectively into our soul, body, and human spirit. The three parts of our being, when God formed man, of the dust of the ground, he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.7 this means that the human life obtained through creation is in the man's soul. When man was enticed by Satan and fell, he ingested into his body the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which signifies Satan. Therefore, the life of Satan obtained by man through the fall is in the human body. When man, re when man receives the Lord Jesus as Savior and is saved, the Spirit of God bringing him with him, the life of God enters into the human spirit. But it, it actually enters into us and dwells beside the human spirit. So there's our spirit and God's spirit in us. And they, uh, they agree with each other. Hence, the life of God obtained by man through salvation is in the hu is, dwells beside our human spirit. Thus, a person who is saved has the life of God in his self in his spirit, but really it's remaining beside our spirit. We have the spirit of God in us and our own spirit. The human life is the human life in his soul and the life of Satan in his body in the flesh. In order to understand more clearly the three parts wherein the three lives are located, we shall spend a little time to discuss the consciousness of these three parts. The body, our outermost physical part, is visible and touchable. It includes all the members of our body and has five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching to contact the physical world. Therefore, the consciousness of the body is called the worldly sense or physical sense. The spirit, our innermost and deepest part, includes the conscience, intuition, and fellowship. The conscience is the origin, the organ for distinguishing right and wrong. And according to the principle of right and wrong, it causes us to sense what is right and accepted in the eyes of God, and what is wrong and rejected in the eyes of God. The intuition enables us to sense the will of God directly without the need of anything as a, as a means. The fellowship part enables us to communicate and fellowship with God. Although it is the fellowship part that causes us to contact God, yet it is both the conscience and the intuition that causes us to sense God in spiritual matters. That is, that to contact the spiritual world, the sense of these two parts is the sense of the spirit hence it is called the spiritual sense or the sense of god the soul which is situated between the spirit and the body is our inner physiological part and includes the mind emotion and will the mind is the organ for thinking considering the emotion is the organ for pleasure anger sorrow and joy and the will is the organ for formulating opinion and making decisions although the soul consists of three parts only two the mind and the emotion have consciousness. The sense of the mind is based on rationalization, whereas the sense of the emotion is based on likes and dislikes. The two senses in our soul enable us to sense man's physiological part, that is, man's ego or self, and to contact the physiological world. Hence, they are called physiological senses or self-consciousness. <clears throat> part D. 
the nature and condition of the three lives. Since each of the three different lives which we obtained within us has its own origin and dwells separately in one of the three different parts of our being, then the nature of these three lives and their respective conditions within, within us must also be different and rather complicated. Immediately after man was created in the hands of God and God dies, he was very good, Genesis chapter 131. And upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29. Therefore, the created life of man was originally good and upright. Not only was it without sin, but also without the knowledge of sin and the consciousness of shame. It was innocent and simple. We were blind, our eyes were closed. After Adam sinned and fell, man not only offended God in behavior, which resulted in our eyes being open in a sinful situation, but worse still. He was poisoned by Satan in life, which caused his life to become defiled and corrupted. For example, suppose I construct, or suppose I instruct my children at home not to play with a blackboard. Eraser. After I leave home, due to their curiosity, they play with the eraser, and then upon my return I find that they have done wrong. This wrongdoing is merely a violation of family regulation. Nothing has gotten into them. Suppose, however, the next time I have a bottle of poisonous medicine at home and tell the children, don't ever drink this after I leave home. They find that the bottle is fun to play with and, all, and, a lot, and at last they drink the poisonous medicine. At this point, they have not only disobeyed my order and violated the family regulation, but worse still, something poisonous has gotten into, into them. This is what happened when Adam ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil that day. Not only had he disobeyed God's pro prohibition, but he also had taken Satan's life into himself. Henceforth, man became inwardly complicated. He not only had the original upright and good life of man, but also the evil and corrupted life of Satan. Satan's life, filled as it is with all kinds of sins, contains the seed of all corruption and the factors of evil. Satan lives within man and causes him to have lusts, John 8, 44, and commit sins, 1 John 3, verses 8. Therefore, his life is the root of sins, which causes man to live out sin. The various sins committed by man are derived from the life of Satan or the life of the devil within him. Within him. Ever since this devilish life entered into man, though at times he is still able to live out a little human goodness according to his human life, he lives out the devilish evil most, evils most of the time according to the devilish life in the flesh. Sometimes man can be very gentle. He can really act like a man and give forth the savor of true man. But other times when he loses his temper, he is really like, the, like a devil and full of devilish odor. When man indulges in drunkenness and cure... Caro, caro, carousing, visiting prostitutes, gambling, committing various sins, he bears a devilish appearance and is full of devilish odor. It is not of his own will that man lives out the devilish life, rather it is of the life of the devil within the tricks, within that tricks him and that causes him to become a devilish man and lead the life of a mixture of man and the devil. This is the actual inner condition of, man, of the people of the world today. Due to the fact that man has the lives both of the man and of Satan, one good in nature and the other evil, <clears throat> has the desire on one hand to be good and upright, and on the other hand he has the inclination toward corruption and evil. Hence, that's why uh, our flesh always wars against our spirit, and our spirit wars against our flesh. Because our fleshly part is of Satan, and our spiritual part is what we were meant to be before our eyes were opened. And then God's spirit that comes in and dwells with our spirit. Hence, throughout the generations, philosophers engaged in the studies of human nature have advocated two different thoughts. One, that man is good in nature, and the other, that the nature of man is evil. Actually... We have both these natures within us because we have within us both the life of good and the life of evil. But thank the Lord today, we who are saved not only have the lives of man and the devil, but also the life of God. Just as Satan through his corruption injected his life into us and caused us to be united within him, gained by him the possessed of all evil 
of all the evils of his nature. So also God, through his deliverance, puts his life into us and causes us to be united with him, gained by him and possessed of all the divine goodness of his nature. This, therefore, just as the crucial point of the fall was life, so also the crucial point of salvation is life. When we come to the Lord's table, we break the bread of life first, and then we drink the cup of remission. This signifies that when we experience the Lord's salvation, although first we receive the blood and then the life, yet in the, his salvation... The main figure is the bread, which signifies life. The cup, which signifies the blood, is secondary. Hence, first, we take the bread and then the cup. When the life of God enters into us, we become more complicated within than the worldly people. We have the upright life of man, the evil life of Satan, and the divinely good life of God. This means that we have man, Satan, and God. The, the trip, tripartite situation of man, which means triple or whatever god and satan which existed on that day in the garden of eden exist also in us today we can say that inside of us is the miniature garden the miniature garden of eden with man god and satan all three there therefore satan's struggle with god for man in the garden of eden is also occurring in us today satan moves within us today by using our flesh and our mind desiring that we cooperate with him so that he can fulfill his evil intention of possessing us god also moves within us desiring that we cooperate with him to accomplish his good pleasure if we live according to the life of satan within us we will live out the evils of satan and thus enable him to fulfill his evil intention upon us if we live according to the life of god within us we will live out the divine goodness of god and thus enable him to accomplish his good pleasure in us although sometimes it seems that we can be independent and live neither according to the life of Satan nor according to the life of God, but only according to the human life. Yet actually, we cannot be independent. Either we live according to the life of God or we live according to the life of Satan. Consequently, a Christian can act as three different kinds of persons and live three different kinds of lives. A brother who is very affable in the morning really looks like a man at, the no at noon. When he gets angry with his wife, he resembles a demon. And at night, when in his prayer time, he feels that he was wrong. He has wronged his wife and confesses both before God and to his wife. He appears like God. Thus, within one day, he acts like the three different persons, living out three different conditions. In the morning, he is affiliable, affable, affable as a man. At noon, he loses his temper as a demon. And at night, after dealing with sin... He manifests the likeness of God. Within one day, man, within one day, man, the devil, and God are all manifested in his, in his living. The reason he can act in such a way is that within him there are the lives of all three, man, the devil, and God. When he lives according to the life of man, he is like a man. When he walks according to the devilish life, he is like the devil. When he acts according to the life of God, he manifests the likeness of God. Whichever life we live in accordance with, regardless of the life, that life determines what we will live out. Hence, we must see clearly that within a person who is saved, there are three different lives. The created life of man, the fallen life of Satan, and the uncreated life of God. Though we have all three within us, yet we obtain them at three different junctures due to three different occurrences. First, at the time of creation and through the creation, we obtain the created life of man. Second, during the fall Due to our contact with Satan and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we obtained the fallen life of Satan. Third, at the time of our salvation, because we believed in the Son of God and received him, we obtained the uncreated life of God. Due to the fact that these three events, creation, fall, and salvation, occurred in us, we obtained the three lives of man, Satan, and God, each life differing from others in nature. Having seen and known this, we can then be clear regarding the way of life since the three different lives of man satan and god exist in us cur concur currently according to which one should we live the life of man the life of god or the life of satan the life we live in accordance with is the life we will live out herein lies the way of life okay now the second part that is about the four laws each each of the three lives within us who are saved has a law. Therefore, 
There are not only three lives within us, but also three laws which belong to the three lives. Beside these, there is, a, is the law of God outside of us. Therefore, within, within and without us, there are altogether four laws. This is revealed to us in Romans 7 and 8. Part A. The definition of the four laws. The central theme of Romans chapter 7 and 8 is law. Earlier in chapter 6, the apostle says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under law, the law. The only reason sin cannot have dominion over us is that we are not under the law. Therefore, in order to explain the statement that we are not under the law, the apostle continues to speak about the law in chapter 7 and 8. Chapter 7 begins by saying, Or are you ignorant, brethren, for I speak to you, for I speak to men who know the law, that the law hath dominion over a man for so long time as he liveth again. But now we have been discharged from the law, having died to that wherein we were held. Verse 6. Later he says, I had not known sin except through the law. Verse 7. Again, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 22. All these refer to the law of the Old Testament. Finally he says, but I see a different law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin which is in my members. And again, so then I myself with my mind indeed serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Verse 25. Then in chapter 8 he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and of death. Verse 2. In these words, the Apostle speaks altogether about four different laws that are related to us personally. First is the law of God, chapter 7, verses 22 through 25 in Romans. That is the law of the Old Testament, which tells forth all God's requirements upon us. Second, the law of the mind, chapter 7, verse 23, which is in our mind, causes us to desire to do good. Therefore, it may also be called the law of good in our mind. Third, the law of sin in our members and our flesh, chapter 7, verse 23, causes us to sin. Because the function of this law in us, which causes us to sin, is manifested in the members of our body, our flesh. It is called the law of sin in the members in our flesh. Fourth, the law of the spirit of life, chapter 8, verse 2, causes us to live in the life of God. The spirit from which this law is derived is the spirit of life, a mingled spirit, mingled spirit composed of spirit of God, the life of God and our human spirit. Therefore, it is called the law of the spirit of life. Furthermore, since this spirit contains life, belongs to life, and is life, the law of this spirit is called the law of life. Concerning the four laws, one is outside of us, the law of God, like the Ten Commandments, while the other three are inside of us, the law of good in the mind, the law of sin in the flesh, and the law of the spirit of life in our spirit dwelling, and not in our spirit, but dwelling beside our spirit. That's what gives us the power to overcome the law of the sin of the flesh. Part B, the origin, the origin of the four laws. The origin of each of the four laws differs. The law of God written on stone tables was given by God to men through Moses during the Old Testament times. The other three laws are derived from the three lives which we mentioned earlier. We know that with every life there is a law. Although a law may not always be derived from a life, nevertheless a life always has a law. Dear Father, please heal me completely of that pain that just entered into my chest or my heart, Lord. Please, dear God, don't let that pain that just happened in my chest be anything to do with my heart or anything bad or serious, Lord. Dear Father, please, dear God, strengthen and heal my heart, Lord. And please take away whatever that was that caused that and please, dear God, I beg you, please don't let it be nothing bad nor serious or unhealthy. And I pray and ask that you please wash and cleanse my heart and strengthen me. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Since we have three different lives within us, we have three laws, laws of co corresponding to the three different lives. And please pray for my heart and chest, you guys. The law of good in the mind is derived from the good created life which was obtained not at the time of our salvation, but at the time of birth. It is a natural endowment in God's creation, not a gift in God's salvation. Before we were saved, there was frequently in our mind and thought a natural inclination or desire to do good, to honor our parents, to be benevolent to men, or to be remorseful, hoping to reform ourselves and determining to go upwards. 
these thoughts of these thoughts of darn it these thoughts of doing good and going upwards are derived from the law of good in our mind they also prove that even before we were saved this law of good was already within us see some pe or some people based on Romans chapter 7 verse 18 for I know that in me dwelleth no good thing conclude that either before we were saved or after we are saved there is no good thing within us that is in our flesh and it does say that therefore the law of good which is in our mind cannot be derived from the original created life much less to exist before we were saved however if we read Romans chapter 7 verse 18 carefully we see that this conclusion is inaccurate for when Paul says that there is no good thing within us he is referring to the condition of our flesh like I said true that's true and the flesh spoken of here, according to the context of verses 21, 23, and 24, refers to our fallen and a transmute, transmuted body. In our fallen and transmuted body, that is, in our flesh, there dwells no good thing. This does not mean that there is no good thing, in, thing at all in us fallen beings. On the contrary, we are told clearly later in the chapter that within us fallen beings there is a, is a will which desires to do good in a law of good in our mind. Both the will and the mind are parts of the soul. Therefore, although there is no good thing in our fallen and transmute, transmuted, transmuted body, there is an element of goodness in both the mind and the will of our soul, even after the fall. This element of goodness naturally belongs to our good created life. Therefore, the law of good in our mind is of our original created life and existed before we were saved, even at our birth. The video might cut off soon, you guys, and I'll keep continuing to make more videos where we where it cut off at to finish it up. Some may say that our good created life, having been corrupted by Satan through the fall, has lost its element of goodness. This is also inaccurate. For example, adding our adding our adding a sour element into the, a glass of honey water damages the sweet taste but does not eliminate the sweet element. Although man has been damaged by Satan, his element of goodness still remains. It is a fact that the element of goodness created in man has been corrupted by Satan and has thus become incorruptible. But we cannot say that it has been corrupted to the point of non-existence. If you smash a glass, it will disintegrate into pieces, but its elements still remains. A piece of gold bar may be thrown into a filthy pool, but the element of gold still exists, although our honor to parents, brotherly love, loyalty, sincerity, pro uh, propriety, morality, modesty, and sense of shame are rather impure and mixed, yet these elements are genuine. Therefore, we can conclude that although our good elements have been defiled, they still remain after the destruction. <clears throat> though they are very weak, still they remain. <clears throat> It is for this reason that the Chinese sages and philosophers have discovered that within man there are some illustrious virtues and in innate consciousness, etc., and have concluded that the nature of man is good. The discovery of these philosophers concerning human nature is indeed right, because within us fallen beings there is still the element of goodness in the law which naturally causes us to desire to do good. The law of sin in the members is derived from the fallen and evil life of Satan. We have said before that due to Adam's fall through sinning, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Satan's life entered into man. Within this life of Satan there is contained a law of evil, that is, the law of sin in the members, in the flesh. Since the life of Satan is evil, the law which is derived from his life naturally causes man to sin and do evil. The law of the spirit of life is derived from the spirit of life which is in our spirit. Well, uh, yeah, and from the uncreated divine life of God which dwells beside our spirit. When we received the Lord and were saved, the spirit of God together with the life of God entered into our, into our, into our body and dwells beside our spirit, mingled with our spirit to become the spirit of life. In this life of the spirit of life, there is contained a law, which is the law of the spirit of life, or the law, law of life. Therefore, we must see clearly that when we were saved, God did not put the law of good in us, rather he put the law of life in us. God's purpose in us is life, not goodness. When God saves us, he puts the law of life in us. The law of good is 
not given through God's salvation, but through his creation. The element of doing good that is in us is inherent. But when God saves us, he puts his life in us. In this, in this life, there is contained the law of life, the law of the spirit of life. This is obtained at the time of our salvation and is derived from God's salvation of life. Therefore, concerning the origin of these four laws, we can say that the law of God derived from God is of God the law of the law of good in the mind derived from the life of man is of man the law of sin in the members in the flesh is derived from satan's life is of satan and the law of the spirit of life derived from the spirit of life is of the spirit part c i'll do part c next because the video is going to cut off you guys so be expecting the next part love you god bless you share this video